Let me ask you a question. I ask it a lot of Christians. Are you more free now than you were when you were a pagan? Do you feel now that you have to do it right a lot more than you did when you were a pagan? Are you working really, really, really hard at being obedient a lot more because you didn't care then when you were a pagan? I ask Christians that, and they say, well, I have meaning now. I didn't have it then. I'm forgiven now. I wasn't forgiven then. I mean, I've got a purpose in my life, and that's cool, and I need that. But when you bring up the freedom thing, I'm just not so sure about that. This morning in my devotional, I was reading Matthew 23, where Jesus is really ticked at religious people, the scribes and the Pharisees. And he said, you'll go around the world to get a proselyte to share the four Jewish laws with them, to bring them to Yahweh. And then when you get them there, you make them twice as much a son or a daughter of hell as they were before. And I read that and I winced. I thought about the freedom thing. Jesus was pretty big on the freedom thing. He said in that Matthew 23 passage, he said, you bind heavy burdens on people's backs and they're about to break and they're about to die and you don't lift your finger to help. You've made them bound. You've sent them to prison. You're twits. That's what he said to me this morning and I'm the most religious person in this place right now. Did you hear about the Salvation Army band playing at Christmas, and the conductor asked the drummer, the bass drummer, to come and give his testimony, and he said he'd be glad to. He said, I'm saved and I'm sanctified, and then he thought. He said, I I used to go to parties all the time. I used to get drunk. I used to get down, and now all I do is beat this stupid drum. Do you feel sometimes that that's all you do is beat the stupid drum? That's religion, and listen to me, religion will kill you. When you came to him, you should have come to a joyous and wondrous freedom. You're not marching, you're dancing. If you came to him, you're let go. You're covered. You're his. And if you don't feel that, then either you've done something wrong or Jesus was wrong. I suspect maybe you. (laughs) Let's look, if you have your Bible, at the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to John. And I'm going to start reading at the 31st verse, and then we're going to flip over, you'll never find it unless you're a Baptist, to 2 Corinthians 3, 17. So Jesus, John said, said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, You will be free indeed. I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. And then over at 2 Corinthians 3.17, the apostle Paul says, the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's liberty. During the last Democratic National Convention, and you know that I'm a Republican to the right of Genghis Khan, and I didn't watch all of it. I had trouble watching the part of it that I did, but Joe Lieberman, whom I like, who has standards, who's a guy that sometimes seems to be a stand-up guy. I like him because I like Jews. 
Uh, we have a Jewish guy who's kind of a big deal with us. And so I, I'm drawn to Joe Lieberman, not necessarily his politics, but he said something that was so good. He said that somebody had said to him that his views were similar to those of George W. Bush's views. And Lieberman said this, no, they're not. That's like saying that a taxidermist and a veterinarian are the same in both cases. You get your dog back. <laughs> When we did our dog show, we had, a, we had a character who came and visited us by the name of Edna, who lived in Howie of the Hills. She and her husband, Orlo, both characters, traveled throughout America and came back to our show to report what they had discovered. They also had a dog, a little dog, named Sparky. And one time I asked Edna, I said, Edna, tell me about Sparky. And she said, oh, Sparky died. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And she said, it's okay, we stuffed him. She said, sometimes we use him as a, uh, to hold the door back when we're in a camping place. <laughs> said, we got Sparky with us all the time. We put Sparky as a hood ornament on our RV as we drive around the country. You know, Christians do that sometimes. You know, taxidermist, veterinarian, you get your dog back, looks the same, but that dog won't hunt and that dog won't bark. We talk a lot about freedom, but not very free. We talk a lot about freedom, but we struggle with that sort of thing because if you are free, you might do something really, really bad. I used to be a part of an organization, and we went around and put on dinners for prominent Jewish people. And in those dinners, I stood representing the church and said, I'm so sorry for what's been done in the name of Christ. The... History is not very pretty, by the way. Chrysostom said that Jews were pigs. Martin Luther said the synagogues ought to be burned down. You ought to read the church fathers. It's so rank and it's so scary, and they were real baptized Christians. So when you talk to a Jewish friend about Jesus, don't do it till you first ask forgiveness. So we determined we were going to do this, and I remember at one of these dinners, a prominent real estate Jewish investment a uh, broker here in Atlanta was at the dinner, and he listened as I said, I am so sorry. There are people in my own city in Miami who can remember the signs that said, no Jews are dogs beyond this point. And I just want to say, I'm so sorry for what's been done in the name of Christ. I wince, and he blushes. Will you forgive us? And this man began to cry. And he said, I want to thank you. I never heard anything like this before. He said, when I grew up in Atlanta, he said, uh, they called me Christ killers. And I, I don't even know Christ. I didn't kill him. And he said, they used to, and he looks Goyim. He looks Gentile. He said, he used, his people in his school used to wait under the bridge where he had to walk when he went home with an iron pipe wrapped in a news uh, paper. They'd go after him. And he said, I want to, I want to, I want to thank you for tonight. Because, he said, I didn't hear a kicker. <laughs> thing about being a Christian is we have a big deal about kickers because we got to be very, very careful. You're going to ask forgiveness of a Jewish friend. You better stop and give them the four spiritual laws because we don't ask forgiveness just because we need forgiveness. We ask forgiveness because we got to go. And it's exactly the same in almost every area in religion. Jesus loves you, but for God's sake, don't let it go to your head. You're forgiven. No, not that one. You're free. But we've got to explain that to you. It doesn't mean exactly what you think it is, because if you start thinking you're really free and that God's going to love you, whatever you do, wherever you go, however you are, then you're going to do stuff bad and you're going to bring shame on the name of Christ. Kickers, kickers, kickers everywhere. And the wonderful thing about Scripture, and it scares, it scares me to death, is that there aren't any kickers. Jesus says, I love you. And you're free, and I mean that. 
So let me show you some things about this particular text that I read to you. First thing I want you to see is a very big problem. You see in the 33rd verse, they answered, we are offspring of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, you will be free? And then out of the text, look at the 37th verse. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I suspect as you read this text, because it says that some of these Jews believed in him and some of them did, and they were drawn to the freedom and the love that Jesus has to give. But the very, very religious ones, the ones who were the most godly, the ones who were seeking the kingdom, the ones who were walking it, the ones who were a part of the right side of the issues, they said, we are free. And they were not free at all. Let me tell you something. Religion and freedom don't sleep well together. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about the church, the bride of Christ. She's dirty, but she's loved, and she's fixable, and she's permanent. But I want you to know you've got to be careful when you start institutionalizing something like freedom because people want to make it into a system. They want to give you the rules so you can be free. They want you to, they want you to write a book on the principles of how to be free because that's religious. Religion is an institution. It'll force you into a mold, and you'll start smiling like everybody else, and you'll start talking like everybody else. And you'll start doing things the way everybody else does it because we religious people do that. And so the problem is that we're in a religious institution. And the danger is that religion can be about manipulation. It can be about power. It can be about getting things done and not about getting loved. And that's a problem that we all have. When two of us get together with one other to talk about freedom, we have an institution. And if it's a religious institution, it's a re if it's freedom, it's a religious institution. And the first thing we do is we talk to each other about how to control it. Then secondly, I want you to see not only a very big problem, I want you to see a significant paradox, verses 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Listen, I know you guys, and every one of you are enslaved to something. The question is, who's your master? The question is, what's your master like? The question is, what does your master do for you? The question is, the question is, will he then set you free? I'm on the board of Harvest USA. We deal with gay and lesbian issues. We deal with pornographic addictions and sexual brokenness. Did you know that one in three guys in America, and this includes the church, and it includes the clergy, are addicted to pornography on the Internet? So, guys, look to your left, and if he's clean, and to your right, he's clean, then you're the one. Listen, what's your master doing for you? Anything? Are you free? Some of you are addicted to other addictions. What's your master doing for you? Some of you are addicted to religion. Oh, man, you talk about a taskmaster. Some of you are addicted to a group of rules about how to run your family. Some of you are addicted to business. Some of you are addicted to parties. Some of you are addicted to music. What's your master doing for you? Let me tell you about mine. Mine set me free. Do you know the story about Abraham Lincoln going down to the slave block to buy the slave girl? And she looked at this honky and thought, one more who will buy me and use me and discard me. And he won the bid. They walked away, and he turned to this young black woman and said, young woman, you're free. And she said, oh, yeah, what does that mean? He said, it means you're free. And she said, that mean, that mean I can do whatever I want to do? And, she, and he said, yes, you can do whatever you want to do. Can, can I say 
whatever I want to say. And he said, yes, you can say whatever you want to say. And she said, the tears welling up in her eyes, does that mean that I can go wherever I want to go? And Lincoln said, yes, you can go wherever you want to go. And she said, then, I think I will go with you. Thomas Quinlan is a Catholic priest. And a student of mine gave me the story, and it's a true one from a newspaper. He's a former drunk. He's a chain smoker. He's got a raspy voice. And one time, in the midst of the cathedral, he drove a motorcycle down the center aisle to make a point. And the church keeps growing and growing and growing. Until last year, he fell off the wagon and got arrested for drunken driving. He stood before his congregation, and he wept, and he said, he said, I'm ready to resign. And this one, they stood up and said, we don't want you to resign. We want you to get sober. And even if you don't get sober, we're going to love you. And the reporter with amazement wrote, he was loved into sobriety. What does your master do uh, for you? I want you to look at a sobering penalty in this text too. Look at the 34th verse. Truly I say to you, if... Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. I got a letter. In fact, I was answering it when I was working on this from somebody who was really ticked because I quoted Oscar Wilde who said the best way to deal with temptation was to yield to it. This person was really angry at me, and I wrote back and said, you twit. I didn't say that. If you would listen to all of it, instead of letting your anger blind you to what I was saying, I was saying just the opposite. I've got friends who say, man, I was so uptight and so involved in stuff that was killing me. And before, I didn't have a choice. Now the best way to deal with temptation and it's the only time in my life I've ever been able to say this, is that now I can say no. You know why pagans hate God? Because he keeps them from doing what they want to do. Do you know why real believers love God? Because he enables us to be what we want to be. That is, but there's the flip side of it too. There are people that will tell you that the freedom you read about in the Bible is only to be obedient. That's from the pit of hell, smells like smoke. Because that's not freedom. I mean, you're free to really, really mess it up bad. Did you hear, did you hear about the two drunks on the third floor of an office building wandering around? They wanted to go down the stairs but stepped into the elevator shaft, open door instead. First drunk fell down three floors and yelled up at his friend, Sam, watch that first step. It's a doozy. <laughs> can, you, can you really go out and do bad stuff and Jesus will love you? Oh, yes, you're free. But watch that first step. If you've got a problem with pornography on the Internet, can you still do that and Jesus won't be angry? He'll still love you? Oh, yes. But watch that first step. It'll kill you. Those of you who are struggling with booze, can you keep on doing that until you lose everything and Jesus will still love you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But watch that first step. It will kill you. Let me read something to you that I read to myself often. It's from Michael Coist, and I don't even know if the book is still in print. He writes prayers, and then he writes the answer biblically that God would give to the prayer that he offers. He has a prayer in his book. It's not very creatively titled. It's called Prayers. And uh, in the book, he, uh, he has a prayer when he's sitting in church behind a bald man. And he thinks about Jesus' comment, the hairs of your head are numbered. And he opens his prayers with, Lord, you've been thinking about that man a lot. <laughs> Are you struggling with the sin? Somebody told me this morning they had this one sin in their life. They've been struggling with it. And I told him that was the best gift that God had to give to him. The most dangerous thing in your life is your obedience when you know it. And the biggest gift that God gives is sometimes your sin when you know it. Listen to Michael Coist and think of the place where you struggle in your life. I've fallen, Lord, once more, I'll never succeed. 
I'm so ashamed I don't dare look at you. And yet I struggled, Lord, for I knew you were right near me, bending over me, watching. But temptation blew like a hurricane, and instead of looking at you, I turned my head away. I stepped aside while you stood silent and sorrowful like a spurned fiancé who sees his loved one carried away by the enemy. When the wind died down as suddenly as it had arisen, when the lightning ceased after proudly streaking the darkness, all of a sudden I found myself alone, ashamed, disgusted with my sin in my hands. This sin that I selected the way a customer makes his purchase. This sin that I've paid for and can't return for the storekeeper is no longer there. This tasteless sin, this odorless sin, this sin that sickens me, I've wanted but want no more that I have imagined and sought and played with and fondled for a very long time. That I finally embraced while turning coldly away from you my arms outstretched, my eyes and heart irresistibly drawn, this sin that I've grasped and consumed with gluttony, it's mine now, but it possesses me as the spider web holds captive the gnat. It's mine, it sticks in me, it flows in my veins, it fills my heart. It slipped in everywhere, Lord, as darkness slips into the forest at dusk and fills all the patches of light. I can't get rid of it, Lord. I run the way one tries to lose a stray dog, but it catches up with me. And then it bounds joyfully against my legs. Everyone must notice that I'm so ashamed that I feel like crawling to avoid being seen. I'm ashamed of being seen by my friends. I'm ashamed of see being seen by you, Lord. You love me and I forgot you. I forgot you because I was thinking of myself and one can't think of several persons at once. One must choose, and I chose. And your voice and your look and your love hurt me. Lord, they weigh me down. They weigh me down more than my sin. Lord, don't look at me like that. I'm naked, I'm dirty, I'm down, I'm shattered, no strength left. I make no more promises. I can only lie here before you. And then God. Ch Child, come on, look up. Isn't it mainly your vanity that was wounded? If you loved me, you'd be sad, but not that sad. You would trust me. Do you think there's a limit to my love? Do you think that for a moment I stopped loving you? Ask my pardon. Get up quickly. I'll give it. It's not falling in the mud that's the worst. It's just staying there and wallowing there. Yeah, you can do anything do the bad or the good, and he won't be angry at you. It's called the imputation of Christ's righteousness. But watch the first step. It's a doozy. I want you to see not only a very big problem, a significant paradox, a sobering penalty. I want you to see an indispensable person. That's at the 36th verse. I know, uh, when I was 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We have this idea that if, that if Jesus comes, he'll be really serious. Rusty Anderson, who's my friend who died this year in the car accident, I told you about him. I miss him more than I can tell you. And yesterday, before I came here, I, I was writing this letter called Steve's Letter that we send out to our constituency. I was trying to think about stuff to write about Christmas, and I remembered what Rusty said to me two years ago at Christmas. He said, I don't like Christmas. And I was ready for the cliche, they've taken Jesus out of it, and the pagans have taken it over, and he didn't say that. I said, yeah, Rusty, they, they ought to put Christ back in Christmas. He said, oh, no, that's the problem. He said, I love the parties, and Jesus messes them up. I love the presents and the decorations, and Jesus messes them up. I, I like Christmas, except for Jesus. And uh, I thought that was so honest and so true and so good. And Jesus liked it so much. And so in my mind's eye, and I wrote this down for our people, I had a conversation going between Jesus and Rusty in heaven about Christmas. And Rusty said, Lord, 
there's something been bothering me for a long time. Could I ask you a question? And Jesus said, shoot, Rusty, go ahead. He said, what about Christmas? It was miserable for me, and I like the parties. But sometimes I'd feel guilty because I wasn't thinking about you because after all, it was your birthday. And Jesus said, that's okay. I was at the parties too. I liked them. I had fun when you had fun because I love you. And then Jesus, and there's a lot more to it. I was going to tell you the whole thing. I'm quite proud of it. I'll repent after this service. <laughs> and uh, Jesus said, as a matter of fact, this Christmas, we're going to have a Christmas party here because those Puritans, and I loved them a lot, but they were weird at Christmas. They didn't know how to party. They thought they had to think about me all the time. They thought they had to be religious all the time. We're going to have a party in heaven that will blow you away, and we're not even going to sing religious songs because heaven is a place where I make up for the stuff you didn't get on heaven and those, and on earth and those Puritans. There's a lot of making up i got to do in heaven. Does that offend you? shouldn't. If Jesus were here, he'd tell jokes. And Lamont told me, she said, Steve, do you know what we would do if we ever met? And you need to know, when she talks about Mother God, she drives me nuts. She is a left-leaning, liberal Democrat who knows Jesus, and I don't even know if that's possible. <laughs> and she said, she said, you know what we'd do? We'd hold hands, and we'd tell each other stories about Jesus. And one final point, and I'm finished. Notice a joyous perspective. Look at the 36th verse. If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and there is liberty. You ever watch orphans try to get people to love them? They do it all. I have friends who've adopted adult children or older children, and they want to be loved so bad. One friend... Their daughter they just adopted has been through seven foster homes, and she knows she's going to be kicked out again. And so she's trying to wash the dishes and carry out the garbage and smile and be nice and pure and wonderful. It's driving him nuts, and it's driving her nuts. But have you ever noticed how the daughter and the son, who are not orphans, laugh and dance, and when they fail, they're forgiven, and they rejoice in the freedom that they have. I did a thing with Steve Camp, the Christian musician, to raise money for AIDS research. And a lot of homosexuals were there. We didn't compromise at all. But one guy who had found Christ because Christians had loved him and was dying of AIDS, and this was the last time he ever came out and spoke to anybody, and he looked drawn. You thought, man, he ain't going to make it. He sang a song with Steve. And he stood before this congregation and he said, he said, my problem wasn't sex. I would have loved anything that loved me back. That's an orphan. You're not an orphan. You're his. You're free. You can screw it up. He'll love you. You don't have to march. He called you to dance. You don't have to do it right. You just got to be with him. Most of you don't know what word star is. Uh, many of you uh, have no idea and weren't even born when word star was the premier word processing program on computers. I had that old Panasonic with a little screen because my publisher made me get it, said I could double my time. So we got word star. They didn't have menus in those days. You did everything with keystrokes on WordStar, and I was the last holdout. I had it until my staff made me burn it. But let me tell you what happened when you first get WordStar, and it's been 100 years ago. You turn it on, and there's this little man that comes up and says, I'll bet you think that if you hit a keystroke, this computer will explode. Then, you, then he goes to the next thing, and he says, go ahead, try it. Then the next screen says, Go ahead and try it. So I don't know anything about computers, so I think, well, I hit it. And then the computer screen just explodes, and the little man comes back and said, just kidding. <laughs> you, ever, you ever feel that way? I mean, you're afraid if you don't work hard at this obedience thing, you're going to lose it. If you don't get real religious, 
it ain't going to work. If you don't just stay with it and stay with it and deal with it, you're not going to ever get to heaven. It's a lie. It's obsessive. It's not biblical. So, go ahead. Let go. Really, you'll be surprised. You think about that.